a small film here down at Nevin Hospital, who superintendent did so much to help the introduction of this treatment in New England. An injection of insulin is given early each morning during the course of treatment. The dose is large and will soon make the patients drowsy. A couple of hours or so later, they will go off to sleep. This is light at first. Later, after three or four hours, the stage of coma is reached. And then the patients can no longer be roused, even by pressing hard above the eye. Coma is ended by bringing the patient round with glucose, which is being prepared here. All the stages of each patient's treatment must occur at exactly the right moment, so all the times are recorded on the blackboard. The, glu the glucose can be given through a stomach tube, like this. More often, it is injected into a vein in the patient's arm. The glucose goes straight from the syringe into the patient's blood and is carried rapidly to the brain, where it ends the coma quickly and surely, a reminder of how the brain is affected by chemicals in the blood. The injection goes on until the patient has woken up. The time of awakening, TA, is marked on the board. Patients may be confused and distressed for a while after this, even though safely awake. Then comfort and reassurance from the nurses helps enormously in speeding recovery. Finally, when they are completely round, they get up to a large breakfast. Then they are able to rejoin the daily life of the hospital. Well, that's a fairly elaborate sort of treatment. It is, it? and uh, sometimes you need about 30 treatments, 30 comas, and you may have to combine it with a certain amount of electric shock treatment when there's a strong depressive element. But you see, um, any treatment that shortens an attack of acute mental illness by as much as a week or two or three months is well worth it from the patient's point of view. Now, what about these uh, tranquilizing drugs I've heard about? Aren't they also useful in these cases? May they not perhaps replace <coughs> insulin treatment yes, one day? Yes, they certainly, I think, in some cases, they're doing it now. I think it's very promising, and it's one of the great advances, I think, but we're going to need insulin, I think, for quite a long time to come in certain other patients. Well, now, another method of treatment about which I think there's a lot of concern is this question of operations on the brain, leucotomy. Now, I think we ought to hear something about that. It's quite true, and for the reason there is so much concern, we've got along, I think, an extremely efficient expert at it. He's written a very well-known book on this treatment. He's followed up 300 patients, he saw them before the operation, and then he's been to their homes, and he's even stayed with them for several days to find out just what the effects are in view of the wide discussions taking place about at the present time. Many of you may remember hearing in previous programs of the complexity of the brain, and may remember it being said that it is composed of millions of cells, and not only cells, but also nerve fibers connecting the cells with each other and with other structures. Now, with his permission, perhaps we might pick the doctor's brains and actually see them at work. This area right at the back is concerned with seeing, and this area below with hearing, while this strip deals with crude sensation, that is, appreciation of touch, pain, heat and cold, and the large unshaded area between those others is concerned with more complicated processes, such as gauging distance and size, and also remembering things in visual and auditory terms, such as what the circus looked like and how the band sounded. Further forward, this strip is concerned with the execution of bodily movements, and further forward again and lower down is an area that deals with speech. But the functions of the most forward parts of the brain, the frontal areas, are less easily defined. We know that they are concerned with the experience of emotion and with habits of thinking, and therefore with those attitudes of mind that determine the personality. Now, the standard operation of leucotomy, which has now been practiced for 20 years, does not involve removing any part of the brain, it is only a question of dividing some nerve fibers in this area. You can see something of this operation by this diagram. First, we come under the scalp to the skull. The approach in this operation is from the side, 
where you see the arrows. Under the skull, we come to the brain. And then, as I say, nothing is removed, but we are now taking away, just to show you, the area of the brain in which the operation is done. And here is the cut. Now, this operation produces many favorable results. But because the cut is rather extensive, it is liable, in some cases, to produce some undesirable side effects on the personality. Experience has shown that very much about the same benefit can be conferred, and with less, indeed very little, in the way of undesirable side effects, by a smaller operation, which you can see in the other diagram. Again, we come to the skull. The approach in this operation is from above. Under the skull, we come to the brain, and then, again, the brain is not removed, only here to show you the field of operation, and here is the cut and you can see that it is a very much less extensive one. You may well ask, why is this operation done and when? It is done mainly to relieve emotional extremes of anxiety, agitation and depression, when these are not only incapacitating, but are such as to render the patient's lives literally a torment. And the operation is done when all other treatments, if at all appropriate, have first been tried. But, you may also ask, is it not the case that this operation has been much criticised? Yes, it has, and in two main ways. First, on purely theoretical grounds, divorced from actual experience, by people who seem to feel that surgery of this kind is flying in the face of nature, and who are apparently without knowledge of the benefit that it can confer. Second, and much more seriously, by people who have seen bad results. If any of you have seen bad results, I would ask this question. Did you really know what the patient was like before the operation? Now, patients can be made worse, and I have known it. But in my experience, it is rare. And it is really a question of good selection of cases. What far more often happens, indeed so often, is that the operation succeeds in bringing back to freedom a patient who would previously have been irretrievably confined to hospital, with the effect that any personal deficits there may be, previously concealed behind the hospital walls, are now more open to view. Even so, in my opinion, these deficits are far more often due to the illness rather than to the operation itself. There are, in this country, some thousands of people living at large in the community successfully and very many of them working. And it is likely that many of you will number among your friends or acquaintances, even perhaps among your employees, people who have been successfully treated by this means and without your being in the least aware of it. Well, now, in, in spite of all that, uh, there is nonetheless a considerable amount of concern, isn't there, about the possibility of this operation destroying personality. Yes, I know it only too well, and therefore I think the only thing to do tonight is to, is to ask one of my patients to, to talk to us. Yes. Now this is a patient of mine who was operated on seven years ago. Mm -hmm. He was desperately depressed and agitated, worried about his heart, and what made me really decide to operate after four years of illness was this, that his mother had already been ill for 30 years or over, and she actually spent 40 years in, in, in her room because of this same condition. And this will show the difference between the old days of treatment of psychiatry and the modern days of it. Well, um, here's, here's the patient. Good evening. Good evening.